Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're delighted to be here, both of us coming in from uh, points east and even farther east, uh, Geneva and Boston. So we're going to try to get through the haze of jet lag and, and uh, uh, tell you something about the Aga Khan Music Initiative. And the format will be that I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes, I would guess. I'm actually going to read in order to try to present some of these ideas in a way that's as, as concise as, as possible. And then I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Feruz, who's going to talk a bit uh, about the music initiative and show you uh, some images that we've put together, including a short film about our work. And then I hope we'll have plenty of time for some discussion. Music may seem an unlikely domain for an international development organization whose aim is to, quote, realize the social conscience of Islam through institutional action, unquote, as the Aga Khan Development Network describes its mandate. But the rich musical heritage of Central Asia, a region where the impact of Islam as a spiritual and cultural force has been sustained over 13 centuries of dramatic political, social, and demographic change, indeed offers fertile ground for institutional action through a specialized form of cultural advocacy or cultural development work. Music and the training of young musicians have long served social groups in Central Asia as a means of preserving and transmitting beliefs, practices, and moral values that contribute to the construction of social identities on levels ranging from local to regional and national, and in so doing, assuring and reaffirming links between past and present. These links, however, are anything but straightforward. Present-day political boundaries that define the nations of Central Asia are largely incongruent with cultural boundaries shaped by centuries of migration, rivalry, and intermingling among the region's social groups. As a consequence, the efforts of post-Soviet Central Asian nations to provide their citizenry with a coherent cultural history often resemble a kind of historicism, and for many residents of the region, the relationship between cultural identity and citizenship remains vexed. By contrast, it is local cultural heritage, the traditions of a particular city, province, autonomous region, or even of a clan or family lineage that typically resonates most strongly with Central Asians. The Aga Khan Music Initiative's programs and development goals represent an understanding of musical tradition antipodal to that of Soviet cultural strategists who viewed the forces of tradition and modernity as incompatible and irre irreconcilable opposites. A more enlightened view of tradition arises from the premise that culture evolves through a combination of continuity and change, and that traditional arts can thrive in pluralist post-traditional societies. In the arts, living traditions are invariably receptive to innovation, while modernism, devoid of reference to, tr to tradition, if such is even possible, can become a profoundly alienating force in society. The defining feature of tradition in the context of pluralist modernity is that an individual's embrace of transmitted practices or beliefs ought to represent a choice, not a necessity beholden to lineage, caste, religion, ethnicity, or other inherited social markers. More specifically, in the domain of art, tradition as a system of transmitted formal and stylistic constraints ought to become simply one among many possible sources for creativity and imagination. Nothing in the creative process of working within transmitted artistic styles and forms renders the products of such work inherently anti-cosmopolitan or anti-pluralist. For traditional musicians, for example, musical creativity may assume the form not of the personal artistic statement or so-called rugged individualism venerated in Western modernism and postmodernism, but uh, of outstanding, rather, but rather of outstanding craft, refined technique, or luminous spirituality. These qualities, no less than formal or stylistic innovation, may elevate, edify, and inspire listeners and contribute to the cultivation of social tolerance, empathy, and inclusiveness. Moreover, innovation may be understood from multiple perspectives and in the experience of the music initiative has played a central role in the revitalization of traditional music. 
Indeed, innovation in tradition, through a reconsideration of musical form, technique, and performance style, is a core concept in the Music Initiative's efforts to stimulate the revitalization of intangible cultural heritage. The music teachers and performers who collaborate with the Aga Khan Music Initiative represent only one part of Central Asia's eclectic musical soundscape. Other patrons, most notably state ministries of culture, as well as the commercial market, market for both live and mediated entertainment, support diverse musical endeavors, both local and transnational. In Central Asia, long a byway of trans-Eurasian trade and commerce, global connections are nothing new. And these days, forging global connections is arguably the easier part of creating art that is both cosmopolitan and rooted. Dramatic decreases in the cost of digital audio and video technology, coupled with the rapid spread of internet access, have enabled musicians living practically anywhere to represent themselves to a worldwide audience. With an inexpensive digital camcorder or even a cell phone, a music ensemble can upload digital sound or images onto any subscription-free, user-friendly audio and video sharing website, thus gaining instant visibility or audibility around the world. More challenging is the other part of the equation, retaining a link to art rooted in a local sense of place and tradition. For what do sense of place and tradition mean in the art and music of the 21st century? For every person who is settled or emplaced in a stable community, territory, sorry, for every person who is settled or emplaced in a stable community, territory, and tradition, there is another person who is displaced, a <coughs> refugee, emigre, migrant, guest worker, or homeless person. And everywhere the displaced gravitate to cities. Throughout Central Eurasia, urban populations burst with newcomers searching for safety, stability, and even a tenuous connection to the juggernaut of globalization. For these people, music that links them through cultural memory to traditional lands and communities can be bittersweet. The music that speaks to them and for them expresses the anxiety and often the anger of displacement. In Azerbaijan, a young refugee boy from the war-ravaged Caucasian territory of Nagorno-Karabakh performs the virtuosic classical music known as Muham, the local form of the vast art music tradition that spans the core Muslim world from North Africa through the Middle East to Central Asia. The text he is singing, however, is not the traditional mystical allegory about love and paradise, but an elegy to loss and displacement. Hey friends, our houses are burned, and only the ashes remain. My heart yearns for the ashes, even the ashes of our burned grave. We have no right to speak of our mountains unless we free them from our enemies. What makes me cry right now is my being made a stranger in my own land. That's the text of the, the song that I recorded. Meanwhile, in the urban soundscape of Almaty, Bishkek, Tashkent, Baku, and other cities in the region, the music that dominates the radio and that comprises the sonic background of restaurants, stores, and many private homes is largely pop music sung in English and recorded in Los Angeles, London, or New York by musicians who have never laid eyes on Central Asia and probably never will. A recent visit to the music section of the main department store in Bishkek, the capital of Kyrgyzstan, turned up hundreds of new CDs representing music mostly from Russia and the West. But in the entire collection, a saleswoman could locate only three recordings of traditional Kyrgyz music. Notwithstanding the personal musical taste and preferences of international NGO strategists, the music section of Bishkek's department store represents a face of globalized musical modernity to which the denizens of any culturally pluralist society surely ought to have access. To, not, to deny citizens of Kyrgyzstan the opportunity to purchase music produced in Los Angeles and sung in English would constitute a form of cultural imperialism as distasteful as the Soviet Union's erstwhile battle against the past. In culturally pluralist societies, musical taste and fashion cannot be legislated on the basis of nationality, nor the meaningfulness of cultural symbols, including music, limited to the citizens of one or another state. 
The challenge to governments that want the artistic achievements of their nations to be rep represented to the world community is in some sense paradoxical. To be entrepreneurial in seeding artistic creativity, but at the same time to stay out of the way. The most effective strategies for cultural development come down to identifying, supporting, protecting, and promoting talented new voices and educating young audiences so that they come to feel comfortably rooted in their own cultural traditions. His Highness the Aga Khan has addressed this idea recently in a speech in Avignon. He said, quote, I believe that marks of individual and group cultural identity generate an inner strength which is conducive to peaceful relations. I also believe in the power of plurality, without which there is no possibility of exchange. In my view, this idea is integral to the very definition of genuine quality of life." End quote. Anthony Appiah has also addressed this issue in his recent work, Cosmopolitanism, Ethics in a World of Strangers. Appia said, quote, the connection people feel to cultural objects that are symbolically theirs because they were produced from within a world of meaning created by their ancestors, the connection to art through identity is powerful. It should be acknowledged. The cosmopolitan, though, wants to remind us of other connections. One connection, the one neglected in talk of cultural patrimony, is the connection not through identity, but despite difference. We can respond to art that is not ours. Indeed, we can fully respond to our art only if we move beyond thinking of it as ours and start to respond to it as art." End quote. The achievement of European artistic modernity has been to free art from national fetishization. Central Asian artistic modernity still largely awaits that freedom. In the end, it is open and candid conversations between diverse artistic voices that create a thriving arts environment. Crossing conventional boundaries of style, genre, and sensibility releases creative energy. And as illustrated by musicians affiliated with the Aga Khan Music Initiative, such musical crossings can just as felicitously occur in so-called traditional music as in any other musical domain. Building respect for both old cultural knowledge and new is key. Creating a dynamic interchange between the two, stimulating experimentation, nourishing visionary talent, and encouraging cross-cultural exchange. All of these will invigorate the arts and make them a vital part of Central Asian modernity. As expressions of cultural identity, soundscapes and all their aesthetic and performative pluralism reminds us that alternative modernities are at the same time both distinctive and overlapping. I'd like now to uh, turn the floor over to Feirouz, who will tell you a bit more about how our uh, music initiative is working to help achieve and promote these goals of cultural pluralism in Central Asia. Feirouz. Thank you for this wonderful introduction. I need to borrow your computer. Uh-huh, you okay. Start. Do you want the, the slides first? Uh, you know, don't, don't okay, okay. I'll, I'll actually, I'll okay. 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 Um, this is not an excuse not to talk, or uh, this is not um, an excuse that I'm going to use for my jet lag, um, which may very well become a factor. And if I stop making sense for some reason, uh, please just tell me uh, or ask me as many questions as you as you as you can. But the reason I'm showing this. Uh, no, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. Leave, okay. it, leave it the way. Okay. Uh, oh, you can, sorry, can you turn on the projector now? That would be... Actually, it, it is on, good. And let me actually get uh, out of the way. I'm sorry, I didn't yeah. realize that this is what I was saying. It's being saying. recorded, and let me get out of the way of the projector. Okay, all right. Are you a left-handed mouse? I can, I can do both. Uh, what, what Azim left out when he was uh, introducing me so generously is that... Um, I uh, was indeed born in Sri Lanka. Uh, how do I get it off the... I don't want to spoil the uh, effect. And Ted, can you get it off the screen? I want. Yeah, that, that, that's very good. Okay, good. Um, I was indeed born in Sri Lanka. Uh, brought up in the Middle East, of all places. Um, didn't speak any language besides English for a very long time. Born to... Uh, Uzbek, Persian, Harazmi parents, but never visited the region of my, of my birth. Until 
uh, the year 2000 when I came to the to work for the Aga Khan Development Network because I struggled to find work that brought me tangible results anywhere else, and I did try before. Um, was not at all educated. It was a little louder, please. Yeah. You can hear, you can't hear me, I sir? Can. Really? Okay. Let me move the mic up. That is the jet lag. Um, and to follow uh, on my own experience of plurality, and to follow on what Ted has just said, in theory, we all agree how important the power of plurality, this is the jet lag, you see, um, how important the diversity is and how important the preservation of individual cultures is. We all agree that the cultural advocacy work is one of the most important and popular in the modern, uh, on the modern stage. But what do you actually do to create a cultural asset? And once you have the cultural asset, how do you turn it into not something that is viewed as a permanent burden on somebody else's budget, be it the national government, be it the NGO, be it the international organization? How do you turn that into a trampoline, a catalyst for development? And how do you stop viewing that as um, a decoration, as a calling card, but use it as a stepping stone? for the cultural, economic, and social development in the integrated approach. I would like to show you just several examples of how we do it. We do not um, advocate that this is the only right way. We do not say that this is something that every organization, every NGO, every cultural development or, or, or international development network should follow. But this is one example that helps me position our work. And to be able to do that, I need to first position the organization that I represent. It is the network of agencies, very many of them, spread really all over the world, that has very simple and unique mandate to improve the quality of life of poor, of uneducated, and of those living mostly in the developing world. And while improving the quality of their life, to offer them a quality of choices through education, through employment opportunities. Because as long as people in the countries where we work have the quality of choice and the, the right to have a choice, they join in in that effort that we call the cultural advocacy work. This network of agencies that I represent is, is known as the Aga Khan Development Network. And it has the mandate that transcends every area of economic, social, and cultural development. You can literally name any area of development that you can think of, be it healthcare, be it architecture, be it education, be it um, microfinance, financial support, NGO development, rural support, education on all levels. We're active in all those. We're active in all those areas. I represent the cultural wing, and in so doing, subscribe to the belief of the founder and chairman of the network, His Highness the Aga Khan. The belief that I expressed a few minutes ago, that culture, when preserved, taken care of, and invested into properly, stops being a burden, stops being something that illustrates the history and the past generation, and the achievements of the past generation, but becomes the attraction for foreign investment, becomes an attraction for tourism, becomes, um, now, let me try and find some visual support. Ah, that's why you use the mouse. Okay. Let's see if it's going to work. There we are. Now, when you subscribe to that belief that any cultural asset, let me repeat, when is, when it is properly notate, uh, noted, when it is invested into, shown a long-term commitment, and um, the assemblage of the right forces has taken place. If you are equipped properly with that belief, then an abandoned historical monument in the very heart of the famous city, no matter where, no matter which part of the world, this little um, this part of the historic wall can be really in any part of the world. But when you stop thinking about it as an abandoned piece of land that conserves some mementos in history, and when you dedicate your time to it, 
and you bring in correct resources, then very quickly it turns into this. That has taken maybe six years to build. That's exactly the same spot. That's exactly the same area. But it has taken about 35 years to plan and execute. And that is the know-how that I wanted to talk to you about. This is my organization. This is the Aga Khan Trust for Culture, the cultural agency of the Aga Khan Development Network um, that promotes the built environment and gives the examples and solutions for communities, for areas, and for practices and beliefs. The main programs of the Aga Khan Trust for Culture are listed at the very bottom. The Historic Cities Program, the Award for Architecture, the music initiative in Central Asia that Ted and I have the privilege and honor to direct, the museum projects and the education initiatives. Let me position the organization in the vast network that I was talking about. This is the Aga Khan Development Network. It would be impossible to list all of the institutions uh, that we have in the network, but you see the three wings. You see the economic development, social development, and cultural development. The economic wing is the only one that is for profit. <coughs> Uh, when I say for profit, we're never looking for um, a quick gain on the investment. I would really struggle to find in any of the projects that we administer an investment that has um, taken less than 25 years to get the first return on. So we're talking about a very long-term, multi-year commitment to the region when we come in with the economic initiative. The social and cultural wings are not for profit. Um, and the financing in the past used to come primarily from His Highness the Aga Khan. Now, 40 years after the creation of the network, the examples of the work have drawn in enough external support for His Highness to um, stop being the sole funder and become the promoter of ideas rather than reaching down in his pocket for every idea that is brought to his table. This is the geographical representation of only cultural initiatives. If I were to put on this map the geographical presence of every project that we have in the network, the only two regions that would not be covered would be South Africa and Latin America. We're present everywhere else. But this is just culture. And again, the music initiative is represented here, but we're not showing on this map every country where we have performed a concert or given a lecture or presented our work. This is the countries where we have permanent structures, permanent offices, where we administer long-term initiatives. The biggest program of the Aga Khan Trust for Culture by far is the Historic Cities program that <coughs> finds those abandoned historic monuments that I have told you about, finds the way to restore them and bring them um, to their best. How does it do it? It studies the conservation methods and techniques that have been used in the past, and then involves the, trains the local community in those methods, and involves the local community in the work that we do to bring the restoration of the monument to completion. In that process, microcredit, education, vocational training, healthcare, and urban regeneration all come into that project, and that is the only way how it is brought to fruition. Let me just talk you through very few examples. Now, this is a photo, this is a before photo of a, an abandoned area in the very heart of historic Cairo. This is how it looked in the mid-70s, when His Highness the Aga Khan came to Cairo, the um, capital established by his ancestors, the Fatimids, and wanted to give a gift to the city, in which uh, he was already doing quite a lot of work. He was advised that the best gift would be another university, another clinic, another school, um, a kindergarten, uh, an education structure. But he felt that the substance that was, most, that was missing most in the overpopulated city of 9, 10 million that was built for, I think, 4 million, correct me if I'm wrong, was the absence of green, of fresh air. And his belief was that building a park, a park for, not for foreigners, not as a tourist attraction, but the, the park in the very heart of the old city would be the best gift he could give. <laughs> Everything and everyone who could be against the idea was there and was very loud in expressing uh, their, their, their 
advice. First and foremost, someone had to find land in the historic Cairo, which was quite incredible. Now, the only reason this spot of land was found is because it was a dump. It was an industrial dump um, covered with waste for many years. This photo has been taken, was taken, um, I think, in about fifth year of the project when all of the industrial waste was actually cleared from the, uh, from the area. And then the elements that you need to have in place to begin this type of cultural development work had to be brought in. The area was clear. The government had to agree. The local community had to be involved. The know-how had to be brought in. All of those processes obviously take long time. And no one has ever given us a recipe to follow, a guidebook to follow. So everything had to be invented as we went along the way. Now, that is how it looks now. Um, that's the very center of the dump. Uh, that is now a 30 hectare, which is about 80 acres of park in the very heart of historic Cairo. That's the aerial shot of all of it. Um, one of the reasons uh, the government, the local government, didn't want to agree to this project was that the park was being built for the locals, for the community. And we were told with utmost authority that no Egyptian, no self-respecting citizen of Cairo would ever pay to enter a green space. About a few months ago, when uh, the uh, festival of Eid, Eid al-Fitr, the end of Ramadan, was being celebrated, all of the Cairo police had to be summoned to the park because they've reached um, their capacity of 75,000 people, all of whom were Egyptian. So the park had to be forcefully closed because it was simply bursting at the seams. So this is um, how much you need to know about the predictions of the local authorities. If you look at it very quickly, the architects who were involved, the horticulturists who were involved, the builders, all came either from the country itself or from the neighboring area. And in the process of building the park, if you look at, the, you know, if, if you, if you, if you look at that aerial shot, which gives you the position of the park in, in the city, uh, that is just an evening view of the area where it's built. But let me forward to the, to the uh, plan of it. Now, that was the former dump. During the cleaning process, the historic Ayyubid wall of Cairo that was buried underneath for many, many, many years was discovered. So the project became two. It was the building of the park and the restoration of the Ayyubid wall. Very quickly, we realized that all of the area that is neighboring the historic wall is the area where the poorest population of Cairo resides. So it would have been ridiculous to build the park, restore the wall, and do nothing for the people who live right there. Now, quite a lot of those people were already involved because about, if I'm not mistaken, in the, in the first three years, um, about 5,000 uh, young uh, students uh, from the area were brought in to become carpenters, to become uh, masons, to, to, to literally work on, on, the, on the building of the park. But this is something that we now call the area development project. Because even though the park is fully built, even though the wall is properly restored, and I will uh, take you through this, this area, this is how we found uh, the, the, the neighboring area of Dabal Ahmar. So there were no schools. There was very little. Um, this is, the, this is the neighboring area. There was very little irrigation. Uh, there was no infrastructure. And um, areas such as Hayerbeck Complex and Al-Aslam Mosque were completely abandoned. Um, so this is the project that can go on for another 50 years. But the, the beauty of it is that having done the work that we did 10 years ago, we no longer need to be the sole funders of it. None of the work that we're now doing in the area uh, the school that is being built, it's actually now built, let me see if I, yes. Uh, that building on the, uh, in, in the uh, left, left, left corner for you, that is the new school for the kids of the area. That is the Alinak Palace that has been completely abandoned, the Um Sultan Shaban Mosque and the, uh, and the um, now which one is this, uh, the Aslam Mosque, um, and the Alinak Palace on the left have now been completely rebuilt and uh, this, fingers crossed, will serve as the next stage for our performances in Cairo when we go back there in um, October with the new group of musicians.
Let's go forward. This is the only remaining abandoned part in the northern area of the park, which will now be transformed into this. It will house the Museum of Historic Cairo, a new shopping mall to generate um, well, revenue uh, and, and, and stable income for the people living in the area. A huge car park. That is an innovative concept in Egypt. The underground uh, parking simply doesn't exist, so this is what will be built. I, I don't have a no cell phone policy, so please don't worry. Um, and it will become an, an area integral um, to the park and the Rabal Ahmar community. Now, let's now move to, that, that was one example. Let's have a completely different example now. This is um, north of Pakistan. These are the tribal areas where neither the government of Afghanistan or Pakistan has any control. For us, this is the region to which, I, I, I think, I, I don't know if I'm making it clear, but we never come to a region without a, a long-term commitment. And we have to come to a region and bring all the elements of social, cultural, and economic development to it. So this region uh, in the northern areas of Pakistan has become a region to which we dedicate um, a lot of a lot of time and energy to have a multi-level development for it as a future tourism, investment, uh, microfinance, and, uh, and healthcare centers. But to be able to develop it as a tourist area, you have to have some places where people can stay when they visit the area. It, 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 would, not, it would not explain properly our efforts to develop local airports, build roads and infrastructure if we didn't have places to house people. Rather than building uh, new hotels in the area, forts such as this, this is the Baltic Fort, and I will show you more, that were built between the 11th and 13th century are now being restored to look like this and be turned into, uh, uh, I wouldn't call it a hotel, it's a lodge, basically, but uh, it w they, they would become those stopping points on the, um, uh, along the trip. And what's interesting is that they have now been restored. They're not yet fully fledged hotels. Yet the local community uses them because they, every single one of them, participated in the restoration process. So they're now being used as the centers um, for the, it, it really, it, it, they become the heart of the community. They become the, the, the community centers. Um, Let's have more examples. That is Zanzibar, and that is uh, another area in which we have been involved for a very long time. One of the examples of our work was finding a building that was called the Old Dispensary. That's the before and after photos. And one of the goals of our work is that once the restoration is over, we cannot leave the region without giving it the new lease of life. This building now serves as uh, an administrative center. And we're now converting it into a museum um, that will be dedicated to, we call it the Indian Ocean Maritime Museum, but it will be dedicated to the uh, <laughs> traditions of the area and will house the artifacts that are not being exposed anywhere else at this point. The view by night. And let's move to Mali. Another example of our restoration work. When we came to Mali, the uh, commitment again was made on many, very many levels. We came with uh, and initiatives uh, in uh, aircraft development uh, and uh, microfinance and education and healthcare. But one of the um, biggest challenges was helping restoring the Great Mosque of Mopti, uh, which was not only crumbling down, but the restoration technique for it was already lost. So again, discover rediscovering the sec secrets, involving international experts, working with the local community, brought this uh, project to a very successful fruition in 2006. Just a few examples of how this work was done. Again, there was very little, there was very little, uh, there, was no, there were no guidebooks to, um, to bring, bring us through that. But those kids that you see on the photos and the imam and his, uh, and his uh, assistants, they did not welcome us with open arms. That doesn't happen in any, of the, in any of the projects where we come. But the main challenge is always make them part of, um, 
every initiative um, that we implement. And that becomes the main reason for success. Let's move to Delhi very quickly. We have worked for quite a lot to restore the area of Humayun's tomb. We didn't work on the monument itself, but we're given the mandate by, by the government to restore the gardens adjacent to the tomb. And once they saw the quality of the work that has been achieved, those two areas, the Nizamuddin, Nizamuddin Basti and Darga, and the Sundar nursery that uh, was developed by the British government just before <coughs> they left India, and houses nine historic monuments, will now be developed into an enormous park, cultural attraction park, in the very center of India. And we will be, uh, we have been called upon by the government to um, exercise and execute all the conservation work. And then populate this area with the attraction such as traditional and newly created music and all the other elements um, that bring not only the foreign tourists but also people living in the local area. Uh, that is the gardens of Humayun's tomb, and that is how they look now after our work. And that was the ceremony where Humayun, who is hiding behind, our brilliant musician, um, who unfortunately had to leave Afghanistan and now lives in, um, in, in the Bay Area, um, had the pleasure of performing it when we opened the tomb after the restoration. Kabul a very important city for us. We were the first NGO to come to Afghanistan after the fall of Taliban and went straight into the areas such as Kabul, Bamiyan, Balan, Ishkashim, Mazuri Sharif, Herat, and we're now adding Faizabad and Balkh to our itinerary. This is the state in which we found the monuments in. This is how Bage Babur work looks now, the, 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 the gardens built by the Emperor Babur. That's how they look now after our five-year restoration work. The important, again, is that once you involve the community, this is what it becomes. It stops being a monument that no one associates with their city or their culture or their everyday life. It really, become, it really comes alive. That's, for example, you see in the left corner, that is the, the, um, the top part of the minaret of the Timur Shah Mausoleum being pulled up by two kids from the area who never left Afghanistan throughout the war and had the... the, the the privilege and pleasure of being trained uh, during the restoration process and then complete the work and have the, have the crowning glory. Um, the areas that we restore do not really have to be monumental or huge, such as the Cairo Park, such as Bagi Babur. Sometimes it comes simply to locating the area, such as on your left, the area adjacent to the park, and simply paving it and making sure that clean water is able to run through the area again. And that makes all the difference. That makes all the difference for the um, people living in the area. Um, I, I, I'm looking at the clock. Let me just go quickly. Those are more examples. This is Syria, again, the, 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 the country in which we are involved very much. And uh, this is actually the next step for the music initiative. We're now migrating from Central Asia into Egypt and Syria. But we work on the restoration of three main citadels in uh, Syria. The citadel of Aleppo, which will now have a park adjacent to it, the citadel of Masiyaf, and the castle of Salah ad all of which, this, this is the work in process, uh, this is the work in progress. Uh, we have begun the conservation work. The future uses of these monuments are not yet, uh, there are proposals, but we have not agreed on them. But this is the work in progress, and hopefully in a few years' time I will be able to show you how these restored monuments are being used for music, for community education, for health care, for, for training of local women from the local community. Let's move to the next program, the Aga Khan Award for Architecture. And we're now we're migrating from the Historic Cities program into the other program of the Trust. It was developed 30 years ago when His Highness the Aga Khan realized that when you looked at the top 10 or top 20 or top 40 or top 50 architects in the world, very few of them would be coming from the Muslim world. And even if they were coming from the Muslim world, uh, they would almost never be educated in the Muslim world. Nor would you find the inspiration from their cultures in their creations. 
the Atacana Award for Architecture was therefore established, and it remains since its establishment, the largest architecture prize in the world. It was established to reward a different approach to an existing building technique. And the winners of it can really range from a tiny school in Burkina Faso, an irrigation system in West Africa that allowed women of the area to suddenly stop bringing water from the well seven times a day. And instead of that, they had all the time to go and work. And uh, that's how the income of the area skyrocketed. And that's how um, the area was transformed. So it could be a project such as that to the new Hajj terminal in Saudi Arabia or a high-rise building in Singapore. The important thing is the innovation with the existing technique and good use of the existing structure. That's the music program. I will talk about that later. This is just a couple of images. And the final portion of our work is the uh, ARCnet. It is an online resource for a community of architects that we are sponsoring at Harvard and MIT, where the Aga Khan program for Islamic architecture has now been endowed for the, uh, Azim, correct me, 27 years, something like that? Yeah, at least. Um, the graduates of the Aga Khan uh, program for Islamic architecture in both Harvard and MIT are being very actively involved in the very restoration projects that I've showed you before. So it is a, a complete circle of education and work and, and uh, the talent from the region educated elsewhere, but then the new skills are being brought back into the region. Uh, that is it on the Aga Khan Trust for Culture. Um, this was us in 2003 when we came to Central Asia. Those were the four countries in which we were given the um, right to work. Why did we come to Central Asia? I'll explain more about uh, uh, after the film. But basically, when we made, when the Aga Khan Development Network made the commitment to the region of Central Asia to help them through the process of development in a very difficult post-Soviet period, we realized very quickly that um, we never come to the region anyway. It was only social or, or, or economic development initiatives. But as Ted <coughs> said in his, in, in his introduction, music was never simply an entertainment in Central Asia. It served as, as, a, as a preserving form for beliefs and, pr and practices and traditions. And the very loss of a um, crucial part of a national identity in Central Asia happened when this traditional music of the region was tampered with. So our goal in the very beginning was extremely simple. We had to go into those countries. We had to find master musicians who still had the respect for their profession, the ability and willingness to teach. Um, and we had to give them very simple administrative and financial means to pass on their knowledge and their craft. This is where we are now, today. Uh, not all of the centers are here because I'm only counting the, the proper teaching cen centers, the ones that we administer in Central Asia. And out of those centers that we administer in Central Asia come these kids that I'm about to show you. Can we turn the sound up a bit?
and we can have the lights back on. This is, uh, I think, it's always difficult to talk about your own program. I can, I'm much happier talking about my organization, but this was an attempt to explain to you what music initiative is. It's education, it's performance, it's documentation, and it's transmission. And every, everything that you've seen is something that we had to come up with along the way. When you work in Central Asia, um, and you support teachers and students, you have to become automatically responsible for their future, for their employment, for their choices. You have to bring back the respect from their local community. And that very often comes from abroad. So you have to bring them to the West. You have to expose them to the international audiences. And you need to, in doing that, render this music maximally accessible to the Western audience that has very little knowledge of the culture region, language, instrument that is being uh, performed, uh, that is being presented on stage. Hence the subtitles, hence the short documentary introductions, hence the dedication to releasing a 10-volume CD and DVD anthology uh, with the Smithsonian Folkways. And we're at the very beginning of our work. The Music Initiative is the youngest program of the Trust. But in those five years that we have been doing what we've been doing, it is incredible to see that if at the very beginning of the initiative we were unable to bring Central Asian musicians to the international stage and put them on the same level with Western musicians and let them become equal partners and equal dialogue, we were not able to do that. Today, we are extremely happy to have your neighbors, San Francisco-based, wonderful Kronos Quartet, uh, and Janet um, Copperthwaite, who is their managing director, is right there with us today. We're extremely grateful that they not only understand our inspirations and understand the musicians and recognize their talent, but they also let their music be an inspiration for the creation of new pieces and share very generously their dedicated audience with us. And that is one of the recognitions, uh, one of the types of recognition that we need to continue to go forward. Now, I think I'll, I'll stop at that, and we'll happily take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, we'll, we'll lift up the, the curtain so you can look outside. This is a room with a gorgeous view. Please. Is it okay if I leave the mic on the, yeah. in the middle? Okay. Yeah. Please. Yeah, it was a great presentation. I was very excited to see the, the Start Shavit Center, something that I was not aware of. It was very impressive to see. One of the things that came to my mind, and it could be because of my cultural background I'm coming from, uh, I didn't see any talk about uh, any programs that will be coming in from the future from the part of Pakistan, Sindh province, and I think they have a huge, uh, rich culture of music. Uh, so would you be able to comment on that, if there is anything in the pipeline that we've been talked about? Or, because I would be very excited to see something like that. I would have kept you here until the end of this weekend if I were to show every project that, that we are involved. So I was trying to be gentle. But Pakistan is, a, again, as I said, we don't make a short-term commitment to the country. Pakistan is one of those countries that we made a commitment to uh, over 40 years ago, uh, not just to one particular city, but to many provinces. Our, I showed the uh, restoration of the forts in northern areas because it's a finished example of our work. But of course, if you look, one of the newest projects that we are working now on is the conservation work in the walled city of Lahore um, and the Shalimar Gardens. And it's impossible to do a project like that without involving all of the local community. They have to be involved in that. And musicians and music educators are an integral part of that community. So obviously, when each of those spaces is being restored, when we think about the future uses of the space, mu of the space music is the first one that comes to mind. So of course, um, uh, not only younger musicians, but also music educators and producers will become very active participants and will be at the very heart of that work. I hope that in the future I will see some of those great uh, singers from the area of Sindh to be internationally seen. 
We were very lucky to uh, build incredible partnerships over the past few years. Um, when we started presenting musicians in the West, again, the reason was very simple. We had to bring the respect for them at, in their own homeland. We had to somehow bring it back to its former level. And the respect in the area such as Central Asia very often comes from two things. It comes from a stable income of the family, uh, of the household, and the recognition from the outside. Um, and while we were doing the outside presentations, the partnership we built <coughs> with the leading theaters in the United States and in, in Europe um, are quite remarkable. And they are very um, happy to have us back with new programs. So definitely, as we become stronger, as we, as, as we gain more experience, we will keep bringing more and more musicians, not just from the countries where the music initiative has the teaching centers, but from the whole um, um, geographical span of the Aga Khan Development Network, absolutely. Have you find that um, people and organizations that you partner with, do they contact you, or is it, like, how do you go about establishing those connections with the particular groups that you start with? It's a very dual way. I'm going to let Ted speak about that, because he came to the region of Central Asia actually before I was born. Uh, so his work and his and his and his, uh, and his connections in the region are, are um, deeper than mine. Let's say my connection is, is uh, ethnic and uh, uh, of a dedicated professional, but his goes uh, just and, and historically goes goes uh, way way beyond. Um, but it, to answer your question very simply, it's in in the beginning when we started the work in the regions where we started. It was very easy to find them because there were so few left. Uh, so, the, the, but but we had to apply the criteria because not every master musician, even if he or she has a wonderful command of the tradition and the instrument, can become the teacher. So we had to look for those who combine the ability, uh, who had the intimate knowledge of tradition, who combined the ability to teach and ability to improvise, <coughs> and also had a very basic entrepreneurial sense be able to get that school, that teaching center off the ground. So in the beginning it was very easy because there were so few, this, the pickings were so slim that we we found our way to, towards them quite, quite, quite easily. Again, thanks very much to Ted's uh, uh, in-depth knowledge of the region. He knew whom to call and he knew which door to knock on. Well, and, and I had a lot of help uh, from, from people like Alma Kunenbai, who's here somewhere, Alma, uh, right. who's on the Stanford faculty, who's from Kazakhstan originally and has her own extraordinary network uh, from doing this work for a lifetime. And Alma was generous in sharing her contacts, and other people were generous in sharing their contacts. So I think, you know, thanks to really networking, uh, we, were, we were able to put together these people. But you, as, as we go along, those phone calls that we receive, and emails that we receive, and collaboration proposals that we receive, they grow from one day to another. So it, it's very much a, a, a two way street now. Uh, as opposed to what it was back in 2002, 2003, when we were getting off the ground. Who are the students that enroll in these music programs? Um, do they have to pay? Um, well, I mean, what is your sense of what they do end up doing after they finish? One of the uh, main uh, arguments that we use when we come into the country is that in a certain, after a certain period of time, after a certain number of years, we have to be able to leave. We cannot remain, remain sort of the life support uh, for any of the activity that we sponsor for an indefinite period of time. So we have to be able to leave. And when we came to Central Asia, Ted and I used to have those midnight talks when uh, he would say, but look at India and look at Iran and look at the respect for traditional music and look at the musicians who can actually make a living out of paying students and tuition. We're very far away from that in Central Asia. In fact, uh, in many countries, we had to pay students scholarships to actually be able to get them into the centers. And what we had to do in almost every country in Central Asia is to have a dual level education. We had to train those future professional musicians, performers, composers, and master musicians, but we also had to train the audience. Because not only did the kids who grew up today in Central Asia are kids of the generation of parents who didn't speak their national language, who spoke Russian very often, who went to state schools, who listened to classical music and, and, and state-sponsored pop art rather than their traditional music. So 
it has to really go on, 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 <coughs> on both levels. You have to train the audience and you have to train the professional musicians. For the professional musicians that are currently in training in our network, thankfully we have enough work because, as I said, the, 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 the um, uh, sheer magnitude of the Aga Khan Development Network includes hotels, includes uh, tourist, uh, tourist attractions, includes all sorts of enterprises that require high-level entertainers that know uh, in de that have in-depth knowledge of their traditional performance. So for those few that are graduating from our schools now, we obviously will um, um, have, the, uh, have the stable employment. But for those um, who go to schools in Kazakhstan, for example, because in Kazakhstan we had a very different approach, uh, we invested into supporting a program um, that is designed to teach kids in secondary schools nationwide basic understanding of their traditional culture, instrument, and performers. And our director on ground there was extremely successful in, get, in getting the, the program accepted by the local Ministry of Education and Culture. So our financial um, responsibility is now limited to training the teachers and providing high quality instruments. But in the future, what we would like to do is to package those methods that we have <coughs> been supporting for the past five years, package them in a way that they become an alternative to the national curriculum and work with the national governments to select pilot schools and pilot programs that would implement them. Again, to give the choice, I go back to the, to the uh, uh, our basic goal of providing the quality of choices and the range of choices to people so that kids in Kazakhstan and kids in Kyrgyzstan who have Mac computers and easy access to internet and mobile phones that they can uh, load any music to have a choice that they not only get whatever is available on the net but they also get people from their own country and when they listen to them they know what part of the country that music is coming from and they know how to interpret what goes on on stage and where those words originate. I was wondering about uh, working in these countries with authoritarian governments and how that affects your work, if it's easier because this is music and it's a non-political thing, or how sensitive people are yeah. about that. Yeah. <laughs> it's just not easy to work in this country. Right, right. Do you want to answer? Because you worked there when the governments were much more authoritarian. Well, that's arguable. Well, that's arguable. I, well, was, I was going to say that, you know, that they're, they're were much more authoritarian. And I'm, actually, I don't think that. I, I take well, that side, but you know, to be honest, we, we can't work, for instance, we're not working in Turkmenistan mm. because we can't find a common language with the government of, of, around these projects. Yeah, I, I hope we will. I think things might improve there now for us. Uh, we're not doing very much in Uzbekistan. We did a lot more in early years. It's, it's, it's really hard to work, to do this kind of work in Uzbekistan now. And the, the way the any 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 agency or program of the Aga Khan Development Network starts at the top. You you work always above board officially through agreements with the government. And you know, and there's a there's a it's a negotiation, it's a discussion, it's a conversation, it's trying to get them to see it your way. And it's not always easy. And you know, there was this funny incident that happened around the Smithsonian Folklife Festival, which we were involved with six years ago, devoted to the Silk Road which the Aga Khan is the major sponsor. And uh, we brought, with Alma's help, Alma Kunimbai, we brought a lot of musicians from Kazakhstan. Alma was a curator of the Kazakh performance. And she went all over Kazakhstan, and she found this absolutely wonderful group of traditional performers. And we created an ambiance in, in Washington on the National Mall to show these performers so that they would be represented. We weren't trying to recreate exactly know, being in a yurt or something, but it was a, a representation of that, so that these people would feel that they were doing it in some sort of a traditional media, and the audience would feel that. And we did this, and uh, you know, a million, 1.3 million people came, and it was a huge success. And a little bit after that, Feruz and I were in Kazakhstan, uh, speaking to the Ministry of Culture folks about a project, and what, a deputy minister came in, and before he would be willing to talk to us about the, the agenda, he spent the first half or hour or so, cursing me, personally, uh, for putting Kazakhs on the floor in Washington. He said, you embarrassed a whole nation. We were all embarrassed because the musician, you made them sit on the floor. 
Why didn't you give them chairs like civilized people? Why didn't you have the government, the presidential Dombra Orchestra with their beautiful gold <coughs> costumes? Why did you bring these illiterate musicians to sit on the floor and dance? Uh, so you see, this is the kind of discussion you end up having sometimes. That's the and argument we got yeah. every time we went to the Ministry of Culture in the very beginning, because the minister would look at us and say, but they don't read music. Why are you doing this? They don't know how to read notes. And, and uh, it was incredible. Of course, you know, the, I mean, they, they would show us someone playing a kalkayak, a beautiful uh, uh, traditional instrument, and they would say, but he knows how to play Mozart on kalkayak, yes. as if that was uh, an achievement. But, but to go back and explain where the tradition originated and why that piece had to be the throat sang, that, that, that was no longer their knowledge. But to answer, to go back to your question and to talk about the countries where we have no right to work, all those places that I showed you and, and proudly talked about uh, us not only restoring them and leaving, but also finding new usages, almost every single one of those palaces, of those parks, of the museums, has either a built-in performing arts center or a space that can be easily adapted for a performance. So our next step is, um, to take musicians, to take master musicians from those countries where we have no right to work and bring them over to those places that are really wonderfully designed for um, an improvised music, for creating new pieces of music based on inspiration that comes from many different cultures. And just let them be, just, just sponsor their presence there for two to three weeks with only one goal. Before they leave, they have to submit a newly created piece of music. And just see what it gives. Um, uh, we have no idea whether or not it's going to be a success, but we shall certainly try. And uh, as I said, we never had a recipe when we got into this, so we'll just go on. Uh, Alma wants to say something. Yeah. Uh, just, just continue with all this follow. There is another um, area we really appreciate, uh, everybody appreciates, you bring this music to the United States. There is another uh, uh, crowd over here. It is the musicians who are immigrated from that country. Some of them lucky to immigrate in the big communities like Afghans, for example. Who we are have Humayun right there. We Humayun have is here. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, you know the, I know you from Berkeley's performances and everywhere. It's, there is uh, listeners for, for this art and people who appreciate it. There are smaller communities, uh, not so um, um, just beginning. This is first immigration wave of but there is, there is a lot of musicians there. For example, Uzbek Doira players, one better than other. We have already musicians in Silk Road House, and uh, we're lucky to have Silk Road House. In Silk Road House, musicians of Azerbaijan who are not known to Azerbaijani community. And then we have adopted kids from Central Asia. And American parents now are very conscious to keep to, um, you know, connection to the, uh, with the community. Do you plan to have some kind of schools of Central Asian or Muslim uh, art in the United States for people who came from those countries, like to learn, don't have any chance to go back, or to Americans who already spent <coughs> like three, five years, uh, students are going, graduate students, now there is open area, they're coming back very nostalgic for Central Asia. And the restaurants are not completely satisfying, just, just restaurants, just mm -hmm. food, there is food. But the music also. <laughs> it would be very, very interesting to, to build some kind of, uh, to drop those seeds of that great activity. And I, I know the result of uh, Agahan's uh, music initiative in Central Asia has changed you know, the landscape, intellectual landscape, cultural landscape completely. Now, you know, this just idea of to be connected to this initiative is uh, already the great foundation. And if you have an idea to something in the United States. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're doing it differently. Um, we're, we're, we're building things, uh, not in the United States itself, but in North America. We are about to complete, um, and this is one of the things I did not have time to show you, but we're about to complete uh, a Museum of Islamic Art in Toronto. And uh, as part of the design that was uh, executed by the great Japanese architect, uh, Fuhimiko Maki, there will be a beautiful um, performing arts center inside the museum, beautifully built uh, with the maximum acoustic uh, qualities. And we hope that centers such as that and many others will become the centers not only of performance but education. And everything that we have 
achieved in the past few years in Central Asia, coupled with the 40-year history of education and the Aga Khan Development Network, will become part of a larger curriculum that we will be able to package in a way that it will be adapted by all educators who are willing and curious enough to, 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 to do so. So that's the next step. Um, I was just going to say, we, even though it's Friday afternoon, there may be a class here oh. after we're done. So, you know, there's a little bit of food left. Please uh, indulge a little, have a little conversation, and then we can sneak out. Uh, and please, you know, continue to, to, to speak to our participants. I, you know, I, I think the image of seeding that was used is a very important one. Alma, you spoke of how that has led to gardens, small gardens, but yeah. it has... Yeah. It has created these uh, these small gardens, and we have been able to take advantage of Ted and Feruz's presence here in connection with the Kronos uh, group that is performing with Humayun and others this evening. So, what you had here was a foretaste of what is to come uh, in the evening. So, thank you all very much for being here. Thank you, Ted and Feruz, in spite of jet lags and all other problems of, of giving us such a wonderful presentation and for your passion, which we hope will continue to inspire the work that you do. Thank you so much.